Life can be difficult, would you agree? Some of you probably say amen a little bit more heartily than others. But there are challenges that face us all the time. And our question as we go through the book of Mark is who do you follow? And it's easy to follow the crowd. It's easy to follow our history. It's easy to panic. It's easy to get all focused on ourselves. And what we want to do is the same thing Jesus was trying to do to the disciples. Get them to understand at a deeper and deeper level who Jesus really is. And then responding with faith. Responding to letting God work more deeply in our lives. And so we are going to be looking at a story which is probably very familiar to many of you. But I want you to suspend your understanding of the story. And instead of going, I know how this one turns out. Let's have temporary amnesia and talk about what would it have been like to be in the story. Because part of our problems, I think, is we read the Bible stories and we know how they turned out. And faith was all good because it all worked out great. That's not how your life works. When you're in the middle of it, you don't know how it's going to turn out. And so to learn what we need to learn, we need to walk with them through the story so we can experience it with them and then understand how that's to build our faith. So let me give you a little backstory to the story we're going to be talking about today. Jesus has been training and teaching his disciples, and he's trying to get them to understand that he's more than just a good teacher. He's more than just a rabbi, that he's the Messiah. And then it seems like every time they turn around, they're getting a little bit bit deeper picture. Like, oh, I didn't see that coming. Oh, Jesus, you're that kind of Messiah? And so he's gradually deepening them in their understanding. And then at the same time, he's also beginning to hand off to them. Because, you know, at the beginning, Jesus is the whole deal. He is doing all the healing, all the teaching, all the, all the casting out of demons as we look through the stories so far in Mark. But now, he's decided to get the, the disciples are well enough trained that you're going to get off the bench and into the game. And so he divides them up two by two. And he sends them out on a faith test. So he says, don't take an extra bag, don't take an extra cloak, don't take an extra staff. I want you to go with what you're dressed in right now and I want you to go out two by two and preach that the kingdom is coming. And I'm going to give you authority to heal and to cast out demons. Go. How how do you think they must have felt? Like, wait a minute, you're not coming with us? Wait a minute, when the problem comes up, we can't say, well, I, I know a guy. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, I'm supposed to do something about this. So he's getting them out of their safety zone, and he's getting them into the life that he's called them to. So the next thing that happens is they have devastating news that John the Baptist has been beheaded. Not just killed, but beheaded. And the backstory is that John the Baptist was preaching and teaching. And if you think about this from a human side of it, Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins. John the Baptist had a miraculous birth also. And I think at some level, Jesus knew that really nobody else got it like John the Baptist did. They were together in this. They were following God's plan. And then not only is he arrested because he had the the gall to tell the king that stealing his brother's wife was wrong. Sounds pretty modern, doesn't it? So... He stands up and says, that's wrong, you know? And so Herod says, you're going to jail. But this dialogue is that he keeps calling him out and wanting to talk to him. Because even though Herod is afraid and sinning, he's still fascinated. And then there's this ugly scene where Herodias, the wife that was, used to be his brother's wife and now is his wife, a very ambitious woman, and her daughter dances in front of the king and all his guests at a banquet. And she does some kind of sensuous dance that, he thought was really impressive and so he stupidly said I'll give you whatever you request note guys that's not a promise to make I don't know what he was drinking but don't drink it and so she goes to her mom and she says what should I ask for and this vengeful lady says I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter can you imagine walking in to a whole group of people with somebody's head sitting on a platter in front of you You see, I think sometimes we've heard these stories so much, we don't get the graphic part of it. It's like, that would have been awful. And so from Jesus' point of view, not only is his close confidant and cousin in jail and then killed, but he gets beheaded for a dancing girl. And you know, that's got to just rock his world. 
Sometimes we see Jesus so much as the Son of God that we don't see how painful this all must have been for him. And so the disciples come back from their venture and they are excited and exhausted. And Jesus is dealing with the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. And so what he says is very instructive. Chapter 6 of the book of Mark, verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. And then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. For some of you, that's the message you need to hear today. Come with me, not come with your television, not come with your screens, not come with your entertainments, but come with Jesus to a quiet place and get some rest. Did you know God has a very high value for rest? He created a whole day for it. And it was because we're supposed to work hard when we work hard and we're supposed to rest well when we rest. And there's to be a restoration And I think we've got it backwards. We work really crazy hard, and then we play really crazy hard, and then we go back to work bleary-eyed because we haven't rested. And for some of you, like me, who are activistic, and you're always wanting to do something, and your schedule's full, and it's really funny, I don't know if you've noticed this, but when you say the typical American greeting, how are you? Some of the top two answers is I'm busy and I'm tired. You know, what would it look like if you said I'm well-rested? What's the matter with you? You got nothing to do? Your life doesn't matter? You're not important? We have this facade that the more we accomplish, the more valuable we are. And it's really not true. In fact, the more you, the more you work on, the more you need restoration. And so he says, let's go to a quiet place and let's rest. Now, some of you need to hear that message today. Let me give you the geographical background where we are. So when you're standing on the the place where probably they did the, the uh, sermon on the thing to learn sign language. She was just interested. They took a class. She started learning how to do American sign language. No real purpose, but just found it interesting. I was a kid that age once. It's like secret code. You can talk to other people without talking. And so she started learning that. Little did she know that God was going to work something else and that her aunt and uncle have adopted a little five-year-old from China who has a medical difficulty, guess what it is? She can't hear. And she only knows a little sign language, and if you know anything about sign language, it's tied to the language. This is American sign language, so the letters are tied to the English words. And she didn't know any of that. And now her 11-year-old cousin gets to sit down with the five-year-old and welcome her not only to America, but communicate with her and teach her sign and develop that relationship. And then they went to a nursing home And they were just visiting and talking to the older people and there was a a lady that was isolated from everybody else. She's like 90 years old. And she couldn't talk to anybody because she was deaf. But she knew sign language. And Anna got to go back and converse with her in sign language. And, And I say that to illustrate what God has given us, what we can do, what we develop, God can use. And we often focus on what we don't have. And Jesus wants us to say, what do you have and what are you going to do with it? Because that's the incredibly important question. Because God has a different idea of giving. His idea is that giving is not about how much you give, it's about how much you give in proportion to what he gives you. And the more that you use what he gives you, in most cases, the more he keeps giving you. Why? Because God has a bigger shovel than you do. And he delights in this process of taking the little you have and doing incredible things with it. So this little boy comes forward and he says, here's what I've got. And Jesus says, perfect, that'll work. And so he takes the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gives thanks and he breaks the loaves and he gives them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them and they all ate and they were all satisfied. Can you imagine what the disciples must have been doing? Like Jesus is praying and thanking God for this lunch and he's going to eat it. 
And then he starts dividing it and he gives them a basket and they take it out and they give it away to 50 people and they come back and there's another basket and they take it out and they give it away to another 50 people and they begin to watch this. Can it really go that far? Can it really keep going? And they watch him feed 12 to 15,000 people from this tiny little lunch and it says they all ate and they were all satisfied. You see, Jesus is the only real source of satisfaction and we keep looking in all kinds of other places. I was reading a powerful devotional called Finding Your Way Back to God and he talks about the gospel in five awakenings and he said the first awakening is the awakening to longing that what people really need is a relationship with God and every other surface longing is a substitute for the God-sized hole in you. And that means that if if you've got your food and you've got your finance and you've got your job and you've got your stable situation, something within you is crying, there has to be more. And what happens is that we take that cry for God and we find all kinds of different things to try to stuff into that God-sized hole. And it never works. When Jesus saw people, he saw more than they needed food. Because you know, tomorrow morning they were still going to be hungry. But they were seeing the power of Jesus and they were beginning to understand who he was. And one of the powerful phrases, almost shocking phrases in this devotional, said every man who knocks on the door of a prostitute is really looking for God. Everybody who ever takes a hit on a drug is really looking for God. Everybody who keeps moving from relationship to relationship to relationship to find the true love is really looking for God. And that when we begin to see people as lost and longing for God instead of all of the symptoms of that longing, then God invites us to step in and offer our five loaves and two fish because only then will they find the thing that really satisfies. Will they find the real answer to the needs that they have? And not only did Jesus do this, look, he gave them to his disciples to distribute. They didn't get to just sit and watch Jesus do. They got to participate. And that's the same thing he invites us into. I want to invite you into this grand plan of changing the world, of saving people who are headed to hell and seeing their lives transformed. Want to come? And we get a chance to participate. We get a chance to be part of that and watch him at work. And then they see this great miracle. Time after time, person after person is eating and responding. And you know as they're eating, you know what they're talking about? (laughs) Who is this guy? What happened? Where did all this food come from? If you feed people, you get their attention. I've noticed that. Especially hungry people. And God is doing this great miracle. But a critical part of it is not just for the people. It's for the disciples. The disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish, and the number of men who had eaten was 5,000. How many baskets of leftovers were there? How many disciples were there? You guys are astute. You think that's an accident? Get it. They came back at the end of everybody eating with more food than they started with. That's a miracle, isn't it? And they were supposed to get from that because they went, whoa, you're that kind of Messiah? Isn't it amazing how we can say Jesus is the son of God and we trust him and we've given our lives to him and as soon as some problem comes up, we're like, oh! (laughs) How's this gonna work? What's he gonna do? Why Why are you not taking care of me? All right? And God takes us through the same journey. He is trying to get us to see in every circumstance, he's looking at us and saying, will you trust me in this? And every stage of our life is a new circumstance. And you think, well, I'm the only one facing this. I can't find a a marriage partner, or now we can't have children, or now we've got too many children, or now I can't get rid of my children, or whatever stage of life you are in. And sometimes it's financial problems and sometimes it's relational problems and sometimes it's physical illness. And I believe that God looks at us and he says, will you trust me in this? And get this, write this down. The faith lessons we learn are to prepare us for the next test that's coming. 
You see, it's a, it's a graduated state. And I think a lot of people just see their lives as up and down and up and down and up and down. But it's supposed to be up and down and up and up and up and up. It's supposed to be developing faith in us and maturity and, and a reality of what's important. And it seems like we keep learning the same lesson 47 times. And I want to show you how beautifully this works in this story. He takes him and he says, I want you to get something out of this. Yes, the people are fed. Yes, we had to learn to serve even when we were tired. All of those were good things, but you're supposed to understand that you can trust me. And guess what happens right after this? They're involved in picking up all these baskets of leftovers. They've seen the power of God. They've seen this incredible move of God. And then Jesus says, you get in the boat, you go back over to Capernaum. I'm gonna go up in the hills. I'm gonna hide out. And it seems like, they must not be great fishermen. Every time they get in the boat, it's, there's a storm going on. I don't know what the deal is, but they, they get out there and the storm comes up. And see, last time they were in a storm, Jesus was in the boat with them. This time they're in the storm, Jesus isn't there. And then he comes walking on the water, which completely freaks them out. Like he's a spirit or something's going on here. And they are panicked. And there's this incredible little lesson right in the middle of this. It says, and he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down and they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves because their hearts were hardened. You see, if they had understood what they were supposed to understand about the feeding of the 5,000, they wouldn't have been so panicked in the storm. Empty bellies are not the same as stormy seas, but the same Jesus is in charge of both. And we're supposed to take those lessons that we learn at one stage and we're supposed to generalize them to the next stage and go, okay, he's got this too. And I believe we would have a whole lot less fear and we would have a whole lot more time to do what God's called us to do and we would have a whole lot more energy to see God at work if we could see the way Jesus sees. See, we're supposed to see him differently every time and we are supposed to see the world differently every time. We want to give you some challenges. And one of the challenges as we are moving towards Easter is we want to invite our community to know that there's a God of miracles who makes a difference. And one of the things that we are doing is encouraging you to either pull out the sign you had last year or pick one up as you leave and put the wire hangers underneath it and put it in your yard or somewhere visible. And for some of you, this is overwhelming. You've been a Secret Service Christian for 47 years. <laughs> and you're afraid what happens if you put a Jesus sign in your yard because you're declaring that you're a follower of Jesus. And I dare you to say, this is who I am. And you know, it's really cool with putting the bumper stickers on cars and putting the signs in the yards, it creates this effect like everywhere I go I see those things. And it reminds people of Jesus. It reminds people that the longing they have is really a longing for God. And it may be a part of bringing them to a place where they come and visit us or come on Easter. And the other thing we've encouraged you to do is to have this little prayer card if you didn't get one already. Pick one up as you leave. It's, it's a place to put four names that I hope you're praying for regularly of people who are in your life or in your school or in your neighborhood or whatever that you need to be praying for and don't cross off the ones you think are unsavable because God has a weird idea who he thinks he can save and he sometimes picks really hard characters like you. <laughs> And so you begin to pray and you begin to put that sign out there and you begin to say, God, where are those opportunities? Here's my five loaves and two fish. What can you do? And it's awesome when you begin to see God working in your life and doing something spectacular because I hope you live for that day when God does things that you know that was way beyond me. That was not me. I came, showed up, I said a few things, and God, you're doing amazing things. That's the adventure. And I'm afraid so many people see the Christian life as a life of obligation instead of a life of adventure. And I believe Jesus is inviting us into the greatest life ever.
that we get to participate with him in turning lost sheep to find their shepherd. So I don't know where that strikes you and I don't know what God's speaking to you about today. But I pray that you'd listen and that you would have the faith to offer the little bit that you've got and that you would entrust it to God and let him do great things with it. I'm going to hand off to our campus in Green and our campus in South Umqua, Pastor Sky and Will, if you want to walk through this last question. I would ask you the same question that God asked the disciples, that Andrew came with the little boy. What do you have in your hand? What has God given you? What abilities or talents or interests? You know, the funny thing is I think a lot of the times people do the same thing to us as a church as the disciples were doing to Jesus. And people know better by now. They come to me and they say, you know, I think the church should do more about whatever in the community. And I say, I completely agree with you. Go ahead on it. And they're like, wait, 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 wait. That's not what I meant. Oh, I know what you meant. What you meant is God put a need on your heart and you want me to adopt it and take it over and run it and you can just sit back and watch. That's what you want. But if God put the need on your heart, then who do you think he wants to get involved with it? You, right. And they say, well, I thought the church could do it. And it's like, well, I agree. You are the church, (laughs) exactly. So if God's put that on your heart, then we'd love to come alongside and encourage and help you, but clearly he's calling you to it. So what are you gonna do? And I think they often get the same look that the disciples had. Like, that's overwhelming. It's like, perfect. Right? Perfect. And I think the most, the biggest faith struggle is that we have all these excuses and reasons why God can't use me. And we don't have a single one that every Bible character that God used had the same excuses. I'm not talented enough, I'm not influential enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not wealthy enough, I'm not whatever. And Jesus looks at you and says, perfect. That'll work great. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for how you move in our hearts, how there are needs that stimulate that deeper part of us that says, I can't stand it no more. And that God, if we offer to you our little bit of time that we have and our few resources and our limited talents. God, you love to come alongside that and fill in the blanks so that people are satisfied because they find you. And Father, this week, help us to pay attention. Help us to see the lost sheep that are walking all around Douglas County and all the substitute highs they're trying to find when they, they really need is a relationship with you. And they're looking for love in all the wrong places. And God, help us to point them to you. Help us to believe that you called us to this, that this isn't somebody else's job, that this is for us. And help us to believe that even though our offering looks pitifully small, that God, you can do some great things with it. And God, we ask that you'd make us aware this week of all of those inconvenient opportunities that are around us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.